Okay, it is 2 p.m. at least here in Germany, Kassel. So let me welcome all of you very warmly to this special book launch webinar. And um, the topic of today's book launch is the Phantom of Upgrading Agricultural Supply Chains. My name is Florian Durer. I'm the executive manager of the ICDD and it is my pleasure to serve as your moderator today. Feel free to let us know who you are and from where you are joining us in the chat box. You can also join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtags value chains and decent work. Please note that this event is being recorded. Let me give you a brief overview of the event. First, we will hear from Ismail Karatepe, one of the editors of the book, who will introduce us on the topic of upgrading in agriculture. We will then hear a video message from Walter Billig, who will historically contextualize our discussion today, as we are living in a moment of transition in the global food system. Then we will learn about three case studies about the three crops featured in the book, rice, coffee, and mango, presented by the international scholars Manish Kumar, then Hawkins and Thales Pena. We will then hear the main findings and lessons for the future from Professor Christoph Scherer, followed by some reflections from Professor Pravinja. In the Q&A section, we want to hear from you, the audience, about any questions you might have. Please use the Q&A box to ask any questions to our panelists throughout the event, indicating to whom your question is directed to. You can also upload questions in the Q&A box and comment on them. But without further ado, let me hand over to Ismail. And Ismail Karatepe is a researcher at the International Center for Development and Decent Work. His publications focus uh, on economic policies and the state, and he will provide us a brief introduction to the book and the topic of upgrading in agriculture. Thank you, and over to you, Ismail. Thank you very much. I have a few slides. Let me then, let me, let me use them. First of all, I should um, underline that it's not the uh, first book that I see the um, published on agricultural value chain. This is actually the, the third book. Um, so it's um, it's the third book that the International Center of Development and Decent Work uh, published with uh, his its partners on agricultural value chain. The first book was Decent Work on um, Decent Work Deficit in Southern Agriculture. Then the, uh, the attention was shifted to occupational safety and health, and and the, the third book, this book, was focusing on um, the the social and economic upgrading in agricultural um, value chains. Um, I should mention that um, um, it's a very collaborative project, um, having um, 11 cases uh, and um, hosting perhaps uh, more than 20 researchers. And, and this book is pretty much based on the field works is done by the um, by Dan the researchers in the global south, and and what we actually um, did in Castle is um, to sit and to read field works uh, findings and the synthesize them. So um, I should definitely underline uh, its um, collective aspect of this book, even though uh, we are noted as a, um, editors. Um, what actually pushed us to see what's happening right now in um, global value chain, global um, value chain is the increasing uh, the production of um, agricultural, increasing trade of the agricultural products. And since 60s, agricultural products are highly traded. And what we have actually detected in our previous researches um, is the decent work deficit in the, in the agricultural area. Who is poor in the southern world than a worker? The answer might be a farmer or a farm worker. This actually pushes us to see uh, to see um, the upgrading uh, possibilities of um, of farmers, smallholders, as well as farm workers in the in the global south. Um, well, I mean, given the decent work deficit, we and the increasing um, the trade of the agricultural produce, we basically explored the constraints of smallholders, um, smallholders' effective participation, 
uh, in different, uh, oh, sorry. We basically explore the constraints on smallholders' effective participation in different, um, in different markets. And we basically explore the strategies for social and economic upgrading. And we took three cases. Um, I mean, we actually choose three produce. This is a rice, mango, and coffee. And, and then they have different features and they have, um, they have definitely different characteristics in many aspects. Um, rice, uh, and then we basically um, did our research in, in different 11 cases, um, as you might have seen in, in the map. Um, and those cases are um, basically chosen um, um, chosen thanks to the, uh, our very established network. But um, um, those countries, like for instance, rice, mango, and coffee, those countries are um, pretty much important um, countries for production as well as for the international trade. Um, this leads us something. Most of the research on agricultural value chain, they focus on um, one product I mean, one produce, one country. And, and thanks, to, um, um, thanks to different cases and different produce, we, we are able to compare. And this allows us to provide some findings. We can compare, we could compare different products. We could compare different countries. We could compare, uh, uh, different end markets, and then we can we could then come up with um, different uh, actually then findings. This is the one of the um, I think one of the well edited uh, part of this book because it um, it looks different cases and uh, and uh, try to find out uh, try to actually then compare different produce and different countries. And, and then come up with findings accordingly. This is a, one of the important aspects of this book. Um, and what actually then pushes us um, is the proposals from international organizations. Um, most of the international organizations, including FAO, uh, World Bank, as well as the big actors in the uh, in the value chain, like um, you know uh, retailers, um, seed producers, and so on. Um, there is there is certain consensus, and the consensus is uh, that uh, if a smallholder participates global value chain, then uh, uh, participating global chain will uh, bring um, upgrading social and economic upgrading. This is one of the proposal and this is the one of the common sense among many policy makers, as well as I said, among uh, several, um, uh, several important stakeholders. Uh, in, in, in this book, we show that uh, um, it's, it's not necessarily the case. Participating global value chain can bring also downgrading and upgrading is not um, is not uh, related with the uh, value chain. This is what we actually try to show. And, and other common sense among relevant stakeholders is that economic upgrading can bring social upgrading. And then with this book, we try to show that uh, economic upgrading can also bring, um, cannot necessarily bring uh, social upgrading. We um, try to show that Social upgrading can also bring economic upgrading, and um, and what uh, we found quite fascinating is that um, improvement in the social and economic conditions and the livelihood is a matter of individual acts of farmers or farm workers. So it's all their choice, and I think in in the in the um, with this um, presentation, I believe Christoph will show that it's not, it's not necessarily individual act, but it's also a collective act. 
and and but we try to show that the improvement of the social con conditions can be a matter of collective action rather than an individual act of farmers. So we try to actually then challenge a little bit the uh, the, the common sense or the 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 repeated knowledge concerning um, concerning uh, the participation of farmers into the value chain. And what we have seen in, in um, again, this is also one of the uh, one of the most repeated um, repeated actually discourse that we have seen is that uh, you know most of the um, policymakers they um, propose very market oriented solutions. And in this book, what we also try to show is not only market oriented solutions but also politics plays an important role in, in upgrading processes. So with all this, we, um, you know, as, um, as uh, being a member of political science department, we also try to um, analyze and we try to show the importance of the politics in social and economic upgrading. But those things um, will be then um, uh, discussed uh, by Christoph later. And all of these arguments that I just paused, that actually challenge more, more or less um, common sense knowledge, is what we have learned of field research. Therefore, I will right now leave the room for our field researchers. And thank you very much for participating. Thank you so much for providing us a good overview over um, some of the contents of the book and also challenging some of the common assumptions indeed, like that uh, participation in global value chains does not lead automatically to upgrading. Um, now to contextualize our, um, our discussions further, we have a video contribution from Professor Walter Billig, and he is uh, a retired full professor of agricultural economics at Unicamps Institute for Economics. And he is also one of the founders of the Instituto Forma Zero. And uh, Professor Billig has published over 200 scientific articles uh, and um, books. So let me quickly share his message that um, shows that we are in a transition phase of the global food system. Hello, everyone. My name is Walter Bellick. I am professor at the uh, Institute of Economics at Unicamp Brazil. I'm very glad to be here in this book launching, the new ICDD's book named The Phantom of Upgrading in Agriculture Supply Chain, uh, coordinated by Professor Scherer and Professor Karatepi. I'm uh, honored to be part of this bright team of 15 authors in seven countries. I was invited to write the foreword, and in this foreword, I wanted to stress that we are living in a transition, a very important transition from one type of food system that we call food regime to another type. This former food regime is called Fordist food regime and has two characteristics, very important, two uh, characteristics that define the paradigm. One is the distance and the other is durability. Distance because the food production was based on known places, regardless seasons and locations. And durability because the food consumption equation needs less perishable products. Now we are living in a transition towards differentiation, decommoditization, as is said, in the way that the movement is growing, considering the natural conditions. In this new model, it's possible to see these oppositions between one hand delocalization, the other hand local products, homogeneous food 
versus diversified diet, decent work against cheap labor. And the, in this uh, new post Fordist paradigm, uh, we have this rupture, this transition that is based and allows the appropriation of rents based on new attributes given by location, valuing locational origins and valuing different types of consumers. But this new regime that is named the regime of varieties uh, uh, after some authors is based in three characteristics. One is the virtual control of procedures. The second one is, as in the industrial economy, demand pool, zero stock, just in time. And the third one, differentiation based on origin or quality of products. Usually, formally, the integration is presented as a solution for the low, the, the low income and small producers in, in the world. But in this volume that we analyzed, coffee, mango and rice, the relationship of subordination does not occur in a generalized and homogeneous way. In these cases, it's possible to see the combination of economic benefits with social upgrades. With the application of new developments as digital economy, post-productionism uh, environment, and also it's possible to see new incomes coming from the reconnection between field and consumers. Well, there is a long way to go for a transformation towards giving access to this huge amount, amount of people uh, malnourished or guaranteeing food sovereignty to farmers, to small farmers. But this process is going on. On the other hand, we have the reaction of uh, agents who control the global chain, the global system. And these reactions uh, are, for instance, greenwashing, co-opting social policies, and so on and so forth. The big question now is how to promote the transition to a sustainable uh, food regime in a situation where the political forces are increasingly disorganized and now more than that, more than ever, caused by the COVID-19. Also, we have the weakness of public regulations, weakness of our health system, low traceability, and this make room for a private certifi certification mechanism. It, it's interesting and ironically, the, in these situations with uh, private certifications, the small producers can capture larger portions of value generated in the pro production processes. Uh, we analyze it in this book, some cases as basmati rice in India or organic rice in Brazil. And the, these cases have uh, shown that markets are not given, but built. Globally, the emergency of certifications is the counterpart to a market deregulation and liberalization. But with the organization of workers and small producers, it's possible to establish specific certifications controlling or coordinating the commercialization chain 
and overcoming the productivist paradigm. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much and have a very good read, reading of this book. Excellent. So Walter made several key points um, that refer to distance and also durability, which are included in the three case studies of the book, actually, and also on private certification and uh, that markets are not given but built. Um, so um, our next speaker will be Manish Kumar, and uh, he is assistant professor at the Department of Economics, Delhi School of Economics. Uh, and in 2020, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the ICDD, and he holds a PhD in economics from the Center of, for Economic Studies and Planning at JNU in New Delhi. Uh, and from Manish, we will hear more about smallholders in the rice value chain and social and economic upgrading. Thank you, and over to you, Manish. Uh, thank you, Florian. And uh, I must thank Professor Sarah and Krista. Uh, and smile for giving me this opportunity to participate in very interesting project and this uh, interesting book. So the chapter which I have contributed in uh, this book is small holders in rice value chains. And the study is about Asia and, uh, Asia and two countries in Asia in particular, Bangladesh and uh, India. The importance of India and Bangladesh in the rice value chain is very important in the global framework because uh, uh, India is one of the key participant in the global value chain of rice uh, through its uh, export and uh, close to uh, one fourth of the total in international trade of rice is uh, uh, coming from India. So in that way, these two countries are very important. Asia as a whole is very important uh, uh, in the rice value chain. So the focus uh, in this particular chapter is uh, uh, on examining the socio, uh, social and economic condition in rural areas through three uh, parameters to compare the situation in Bangladesh and India. So we are using a cross-country assessment which allows us to explore uh, the impact of country's socio-economic setting and policies uh, on its advancement. The, the second parameter that we use is evaluation of the value chains for domestic versus international markets. And the third parameter is appraisal of two rice producing states within India. Uh, so the following questions were very critical, uh, research questions were critical in this chapter, which we tried our best to answer. So we first tried to answer uh, the impact of different in markets on the livelihood conditions of the smallholders and uh, farm workers. The second question that we asked was the uh, key factors that influences the market opportunities available in these uh, uh, studied areas. And what are the barriers in accessing those opportunities? The third question is strategies towards the social and economic upgrading in these value chains. While answering these three questions, we are also trying to understand the overall state intervention in the value system and how the state intervention is shaping the overall value system. Uh, the overview of the methodology is the following. We, uh, in case of Bangladesh and India, we are using secondary data from national and international sources. Uh, but the major part of this study is, uh, is from our primary data collection. Two main produce, production areas in Bangladesh was focused, uh, Bogra and Rangpur districts, and in, in, in India, Bihar and Punjab, two states, and in each state, two districts were uh, focused for collection of data from farmers, from wholesale, wholesalers, traders, uh, rice mill owners, managers, etc. So we conducted focus group discussion with uh, uh, workers. So this is the main uh, data sources that we use. So the first question that we try to ask and try to answer in this uh, uh, chapter that what are the various in markets and how farmers are connected with uh, these in markets in that uh, export is very critical segment. And as we can see, uh, the uh, approach of farmers or the connection of farmers with the in markets and especially the export segment that primarily depends upon 
the variety of paddy uh, in case of rice value chain so in india that pro produces almost 100 uh, more than 100 varieties of uh, paddy which can be clubbed into two groups basmati and non basmati and for basmati almost half of the total produce uh, indian produce is actually uh, goes to the international market however in case of non basmati varieties it is uh, close to 10% apart from export segment the another important segment and the very significant segment of uh, in market is public procurement agencies uh, but in case of public procurement agencies we see a regional pattern so situation of public procurement in bihar is totally different from public procurement in punjab in case of bihar you can see uh, this uh, the proportion of public procurement out of total production in the state varies from 10% to 25% whereas it is uh, between 70% and 95% in the referred area, uh, years uh, as you can see so not only the varieties of crop but also the uh, regional pattern regional uh, policies are also influencing factor in deciding the in markets uh, as we can see the public procurement is one critical in intervention in this uh, value chain value system of paddy uh, other than that state also intervenes in the uh, through input support and price support price support is very much indicative in case of india because government of india uh, announces minimum support price which is applicable only for the public procurement whereas uh, input support is also uh, uh, varies across states in some state you will find that uh, government uh, the state government in particular provides electric electricity subsidy in case, for example in punjab electricity for agriculture is free although uh, whereas fertilizer subsidy is uh, provided throughout india now this is based on primary data primary work which uh, i conducted uh, in 2018 so the data is uh, from 2017 information is for 2017 uh, two districts were covered katihar and patna in bihar the situation is not only having a regional pattern but but within a particular state you will have a different structure of the value system of paddy so one uh, this that we studied uh, for this chapter was katihar which was flood affected in completely flood affected in 2017 and due to flood almost 75% of the total area under cultivation was uh, uh, destroyed because of flood and the, the remaining out of the remaining 60% was traded with the local traders 40% was consumed at home by farmers similarly you can see the similar pattern in patna although it was not flood affected so the 60% of the total produce was traded with uh, local traders and uh, uh, close to 22% was traded with uh, uh, was consumed at home the proportion of total uh, produce which was traded with the public procurement agencies through state uh, agency uh, was close to 19% in patna it was 0% in case of uh, bihar we will discuss it in detail if there is any question on this as uh, aspect we have a very uh, different kind of structure of value system in punjab where we also see the difference between value system uh, depending upon the structure uh, the variety of paddy so for basmati you have a different structure as reflected here uh, in basmati you don't have any public procurement government does not procure basmati varieties uh, it is directly going to the end, uh, private players and uh, uh, export segment in non basmati government procures almost ninth, uh, entire produce non basmati uh, paddy from farmers in patiala district but public procurement is very limited in amritsar so what is the impact of overall this uh, connection between different end markets different segments so we can see here uh, uh, the earning by small holders in case of different varieties i am not going in that detail we can discuss it uh, uh, later if there is any question on that but overall we can see uh, if a farmer who is uh, uh, using uh, borrowed money for cultivation and using uh, someone else or leased in land 
in that case he is not making any profit in case in in uh, bihar as well as punjab whereas the other actors in the value system it is local trader wholesaler or uh, uh, processor or rice mill they are making profit at the same time whereas farmers are not making profit uh, uh, this is the uh, uh the earning of different actors in the value system in punjab so we also had a discussion about decent work parameters so in case of uh, uh in case of india the average estimated wage in punjab was rupees 200 to 400 per day for male workers and 170 per day for female worker and some snacks and tea uh in bihar it was between 250 uh, to 200 the estimated number of permanent workers per farm uh, was uh, uh, close to 30 uh, out of 30 surveyed farms only six farm farms reported to have one permanent worker in bihar it was zero so the estimated number of temporary workers was 48% in punjab and 57% in bihar uh, the amount of uh, hours worked on the field was between 8 and 12 hours the uh, share of male workers was close to 60% in punjab and 40% in bihar and uh, uh, the associational power of worker in uh, patna district of bihar uh, only in patna district of bihar we found some connection there uh, with some ngos so this was the main findings from our study which uh, we have written in this chapter uh, if there is any question i am uh, i would welcome that to discuss in question and answer session thank you thank you once great thank you so much uh, manish and indeed if you have any questions for manish on rice in india please put that in the q and a box and we will try to answer as many questions as possible during the q and a section at the end of this event and uh, manish really highlighted that uh, smallholders are diverse and that land tenure is a key issue and that state intervention can look different in even different states um now let's move from a from rice which is a um a food staple to something very perishable which is mangoes so allow me to introduce Talis Peña who is assistant professor at the department for economics at the federal university of rio grande do norte in brazil he received his phd in economic development from the institute of economics at the university of campinas and he will present us some insights on economic and social upgrading uh in the mango value chain in brazil and pakistan thank you and over to you talis thank you florian uh, nice to see everybody this amazing team that did this uh, incredible uh, research and congrats once again to christoph and dismayo for editing this very important book for us uh, let me share my screen with you guys Uh, well, um, I will talk a little bit about the mango value chain. I will focus on the Brazilian case. Well, the, the Pakistani case is so amazing, and I'm not too able to speak. So I, I think Mubash is in the audience, so uh, I can send to him the, the, the questions about and keep the, the, the mystery about the, uh, the, the Pakistani case for the audience. Uh, well, why instead mango value chain was important? Uh, it's uh, this graph show the the last twenty years the mango trade flow increased almost four times, and so much in a very short space. And one thing that's very important to see also is that only seven countries holds more than seven percent of the total flow of the 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 the, the mango uh, trade, the national trade. So uh, it's a it's a market that increases uh, quickly and is very concentrated in some countries. And we highlight here Mexico, Brazil, then Thailand and Pakistan. There is the the, the major ones. Um, as I told you, I will focus on the the case of Brazil uh, and some aspects. First of all, uh, it's important to understand that Brazil is a huge country 
and is in one of the major agricultural countries in the world. Uh, but the mango produce production is concentrated in a very tiny area around here. And these two small dots, green dots, on the middle of the Brazilian Northeast. Uh, these are two municipalities that holds more than 90% of the Brazilian mango exports. Uh, why interesting? Why is interesting to understand uh, these these municipalities? Because they are in the semi arid area. Uh, in the the left, uh, we ha we have this photograph from the the, the region. As, as you can see, the region has a huge river, the San Francisco River, and but is in the middle of the semi arid. So if the area is not irrigated, this gray is the main um, um, scene of the region. So we are very 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 difficult to produce them. And also, uh, this region is the middle of the Brazilian Northeast, which is one of the poorest Northeast region and concentrates the rural poverty uh, uh, people in the in, in Brazil. So uh, it's uh, it's very it's a very interesting topic to to highlight. Uh, well, in these two municipalities, uh, it's Petrolina and Juazeiro, it's in the middle of the Northeast. We have uh, this this feature of the producer. We have um, we can say that we have three different kinds of producers. We have large farmers, medium scale producers, and small scale uh, producers. And they are very um, uh, different among them and very different inside them. So it's, uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to um, create a very homogeneous pattern of the, 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 the producer. But uh, uh, I can highlight some aspects that's important to say. Uh, the large farmers, when I speak in large farmers, is it's farmers that have an average more than 400 of hectares. It's huge. When I'm, I'm talking about small uh, scale producers, I'm, th I'm, th I'm talking about uh, uh, producers who has um, seven hectares. For some countries, it's, it's, it's huge, but in Brazil, it's small scale, small scale producers. Um, despite the 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 uh, the large farmers has a huge area. Most of the, 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 the producers in the region are small scale, around 7% of the, the producers are uh, small scale producers. And the large farm is only 5%. Uh, but uh, the, the quantity of stones produced is uh, in the large farm is very, uh, it's bigger than the small scale producer, around 10,000 tons per year and the producer 775 uh, tons per year. Uh, the differentiation among them is the the hiring of the, the for workers. The large farmers has uh, uh, contract a lot of workers in the temporary contracts. As I was, I will speak a little bit more this on on ahead. Uh, and the small scale producers, basic family farmers, so they don't have. Uh, uh, huge quantities of uh, workers but for some of tasks of the production they hire and outsourcing some uh some uh working uh oh, some workers for these tasks uh the large farmers are very uh, uh, uh there's a, a, a good infrastructure they have packing house and they have certifications and uh, the small scale producer doesn't have packing house and no certifications uh, this is the the chain uh, the, the the chain of uh, the agents in the in the pro mango producing in the Brazilian Northeast. Uh, down here we have the input industry. Do we have large farmers, medium scale producers, certified, not certified, the small scale producers. The small scale producers say sales to middlemen or directly for food procurement public programs that. Who, who has helped a lot uh, the, the distribution and the trade for the small scale producers. The large farmers and the major scale farmers are some are organized cooperatives uh, and uh, sell, sales directly to the domestic market for supermarkets or sales directly to the international market for wholesalers and retailers. Well, uh, uh, Methodologically, we try to highlight broadly the social and economic condition of these agents in the mango value chain in Brazil. And we try and triangulate the statistical data with interviews and some reports uh, by stakeholders. 
and this was we what we tried to do and uh, reunite all the information around this uh, this this topic. We also did uh, a cost benefit analysis for measuring the value capture, which I will show to you. Well, in economic upgrading, social upgrading, in literature review, uh, we, we can summarize that the economic upgrading can be uh, differentiated by types, chain upgrading, functional upgrading, process upgrading, or product upgrading. And thinking about economic upgrading, I, I true, in order to present here, the summer, a summary of the, the results of the, of the chapter. Uh, for big and medium-sized producers, we cannot identify chain upgrading or functional upgrading. The, the, the producers or the chain, the value chain of mango in Brazil do not differentiate the products in order to get better profit margins. Uh, the, the product upgrading that occur in the chain, in the Brazilian chain, was in order to get better mango qualities in for access the international market. It's not for access better profit margin, but it's a conditional for access the, the international market, which the, the final consumer demands some uh, aspects of the mango, like size, color, and taste, or the, uh, the, the consistency of the fruit. Uh, we also identify uh, improves in the harvest and post-harvest Techniques we can uh, uh, drive to uh, process upgrading. Uh, for small holders, the chain upgrading and function upgrading does not occur, but the product upgrading and process upgrading is very limited, mostly because they have difficult to access policies to absorb techniques and uh, improve the product or the, especially the process upgrading, which the process upgrading is, uh, requires a lot of uh, knowledge about techniques of harvest and post-harvest, and also uh, and machinery and uh, inputs, which is very expensively without uh, credit and uh, knowledge of the, the how to do is very difficult for the small holders uh, access or um, I can say uh, uh, absorb this. Well, uh, we try to uh, identify how the, the the value is captured along the mango value chain. Uh, uh, I try to highlight uh, three different markets: Netherlands for the Europe, USA for uh, the America. Which you want? The, these are the major importers in the world, and also the domestic market. Uh, which we can uh, highlight here. Is that the, the the fuel workers get uh, to fill of this value generate along the chain in the international market around one and two percent in the domestic market four percent. This differences the, the this difference are, are, are around the the domestic market and the international market basically is because the 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 the, the exchange rate that we make the the international market more profitable to the to the producers. Uh, it's important to also highlight that the end market is the, the place that holds the larger margins. The retailers and the wholesalers hold more than th one third of the of the the value capture alone. Uh, beside, we can see here that the pro producers' margins is is a little bit. It's a considerable amount, 38% uh, for the Netherlands, 26% for the United States, and 26% uh, for the domestic market. It's important to uh, highlight that here I also had some uh, costs that is very difficult to address, uh, which I mean by transaction costs, that we, the, the cost of the doing the business uh, is inside of this producer margin. So uh, the, this margin is not so big uh, for, the, for the producers. Um, well, when we, when we think about uh, social upgrading, it's a very difficult task and involves a lot of uh, aspects, but the, the book was very uh, precisely to address social upgrading in, in terms of decent work deficit. And that's what uh, uh, I and my, my colleagues in the, in, the, in the book and the chapter try to address and uh, looking at. First of all, uh, uh, the mango value chain in, in Brazil 
uh, hire us a considerable amount of people, but this is very seasonal. Uh, the mango production uh, is not less, is not intense in um, in workers, but in some season of the production, they need workers for specific tasks, and so the hiring uh, occurs in the second semester, and the layoffs occur in the first semester. So it's very unstable. So the the the, the formal workers here is only the formal workers. Uh, they are. Uh, they are hired in some um, part of the year, but this was uh, fired in another. So they uh, have this in, unstable uh, market, uh, labor market. Uh, here I show uh, the, the, pro the process of production, mango production. As I said, uh, the mango production is not intense in work, but some tasks like pruning, cutting, harvest, and post harvest are very intense. And these uh, tasks are concentrated in the second semesters, in the second semester. That's why they have a huge uh, uh, a peak of, uh, of hiring in the Brazilian labor market for mango production. Uh, but what happened in the labor market and what we can say about decent work methods? First of all, it's important to separate formal workers from informal workers because the formal workers we we identify in that the formal workers have some uh, improvements on the working condition, and this improvement is based on the coaction of uh, some drivers. On one hand, uh, the changes in the international market and especially the arise of the certification bar uh, in the late of nineties that highlights some uh, uh, compliance system for uh, working condition and environment uh, pr uh, make some press, uh, oppression in the, in the producers in the late of the 90s in Brazil. So the certification uh, bodies uh, asks for better, uh, for better conditions in some level for the workers, especially for the environment and uh, mostly for uh, traceability and food security. Uh, when I mean food security is about the uh, security of food consumption after the cases of the contamination of foods like uh, the, the bad, mad cow disease. Uh, and this was one driver for the international market, but in the, in, in the, in the domestic plan uh, uh, atmosphere, there's an important change also. Uh, after the, the, the dictatorship period, we have a new constitution in 1998 uh, that gave uh, a room for the collective organization for the labor unions now are able to make their uh, more uh, uh, acting in the, in the field. And also the, uh, fis uh, uh, the fiscalization body, body of the, the labor mar uh, for, for the labor legislation gave, uh, had more authority to uh, uh, not be pressured by the local elites. So we have this, this change in the international market, but in domestic market, the, 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 the unions are uh, had more uh, action and the fiscalization body of the labor legislation in, uh, in Brazil had uh, authority to go to the, the, the rural areas and apply the legislation. What happened? For the former worker, we have a collective bargain since 1997. And uh, they adopt the Brazilian minimum wage, which now is uh, around $250. And uh, now they, add, they have adequate work equipment, uh, have 44 hours of work, work weekly. And they have this in improvement. However, uh, it's important to say that this uh, very unstable market that the, 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 the demand of the, the workers is very concentrated only for a few tasks of the, of the mango production that makes room for informal workers' presence. And most of them are inside of medium, medium size and small farms uh, uh, because they, the, this, this worker is specialized in some groups and for in groups for some tasks like pruning, cutting, or picking, and the, this medium size or or not uh, uh, or other farms contract them only to 
uh, execute these tasks uh, and they pay, uh, 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 they have not a formal contract, it's informal contract. And this is something that are, is a blind spot for the certification body. They are not seeing this, uh, uh, this uh, event occur and the, the, the certification bar doesn't make uh, any difference for this. And also for the inspections of the labor ministry, it's very difficult because the, the, the inspections are very random, are random, and the region have more than 3,000 farms, and the, the ministry has uh, not much money to this fiscalization. So uh, these practices are spreading around the, the, the mango production. Uh, so it's very important to say that the formal works get improvement, but we have a huge amount of uh, work, informal workers that leave uh, that leaves without this condition that improve the the, the work uh, working uh, conditions for the formal workers. In the, in order of to see the small scale producers, basically family farmers, the main change, as I, I pointed out earlier, uh, is the access to credit in technical assistance and the asymmetrical relation with the middleman. Uh, they have very difficult to, to access policies uh, for improve them uh, for a better conditions. Uh, so I, I, I think I'm still on time. Uh, I, will, I would like to thank the opportunity and uh, I have a nice event today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thales. Now, if you have any questions on Thales' presentation, please put them in the Q&A box. And um, indeed, it's uh, something that the book explores is are the different ways of upgrading, social and economic upgrading. And then, as we've heard also in economic upgrading, there are very different ways from functional to product to process upgrading. So uh, if you want to learn more about that, make sure to read the book and including this chapter. And now we will move from mangoes, a highly perishable um, crop, of course, to um, coffee. And for that, we will hear from Daniel Hawkins, who is the director of the Worker-Driven Labor Enforcement Center in Colombia and the former director of the National Union School of Colombia. He has a PhD in political science and a master's in global political economy from the University of Kassel. Thank you so much, Dan, and over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Florian. Uh, a big hi to all my colleagues, to uh, Christoph Scherer, to Ismael, uh, and to everyone else who's here today joining us. I'll just try to um, share my screen. Everything is okay, you can see that there? Yes. Okay, yeah. perfect, wonderful. So, um, of course, with the time limitations, uh, maybe I won't be able to go into depth in terms of the findings, uh, the methodological focus of what we did, looking at the economic and social upgrading possibilities and constraints in these four uh, coffee producing countries. Uh, we have Brazil, Colombia, Vietnam, the three biggest uh, pr producers in the world by almost, uh, by a long way, they account for 60% more or less of world coffee production. And India, which is the eighth biggest coffee producer, not historically associated with coffee, but still very interesting as a, as a comparative case. Uh, as I focused uh, the work on co the Colombian case, I'm going to maybe um, give it a little bit more uh, priority in this, uh, basically because I know it a lot more, uh, but I will try to uh, broaden out a little bit in terms of the kind of focus of the study, what we were looking to do, and then also the main findings of this. Uh, so firstly, just, um, just a brief methodological overview. So the people not so familiar with these, these case studies know kind of um, what they were based upon. So with Brazil, we had the primary and sec secondary data. Uh, and, and I think as these are mostly, these are combining kind of qualitative and quantitative data, the statistics from FAO, from the National Coffee Associations in the different countries, the Banco de la República in, in Colombia's case, etc. Uh, but I think it's very important in terms of specifically the social upgrading 
facets to this case, the qualitative field work that we undertook in the different countries with Brazil, the 20 thematic oral interviews with different stakeholders, uh, close-ended questionnaires to coffee producers. In Colombia, the same uh, informal interviews with 35 coffee pickers. Uh, in India, 64 coffee producing farmer household questionnaires. And for the case in Vietnam, 17 smallholders in the Dak Lak province and 14 members of a coffee cooperative. Uh, just in terms of the geographical focus of the selected countries. So in Brazil, uh, the focus was in the Cerrado Minero in uh, Minas Gerais region, which is the biggest kind of coffee producing region of the country, 12% uh, in terms of area and 16% more or less of the national production. In Colombia, it was in the Antioquian uh, province, uh, two different municipalities, Andes and Ciudad Bolivar. Uh, they are respectively the sixth and eighth biggest coffee producing municipalities in Colombia for 2016 around two and a half percent of national production they account for very historic regions of coffee production there. In India, the region selected was the Sirapura village. Uh, and that's kind of the key uh, region, coffee producing region of, of India. And obviously that was why it was kind of selected here. And for Vietnam, the Dak Lak province, also because it's a, one of the biggest coffee producing regions, 30% of uh, national coffee production, but also because it has one of the highest uh, presence in terms of certified coffee. So just um, quickly, you can kind of see uh, visually, geographically, where coffee production is focused in Brazil, kind of the Eastern coastline, Minas Gerais, outside of Sao Paulo, obviously, historically, it began kind of in the Rio de Janeiro region and then moved a little bit uh, inland for more uh, adaptable climatic conditions. In Colombia, Colombia, the coffee production is spread all over the country because you have the, the three mountainous Andean ranges, which allows for a multiple kind of diversity of, of production there all along going up towards 2,200, 2,300 uh, meters above sea level. And then where we were focusing for Vietnam as well, in, in the province already mentioned. And just kind of to, to go into here, just so people are aware of kind of the distribution of, of coffee production across these countries. Brazil, as always, it has been the, the dominant player in the coffee, the coffee game uh, since the, the early 19th century. It's been number one and it's never fallen below that position. Uh, Colombia, prior to kind of the late 90s, beginning of 2000, was always the second biggest producer in the world, but it was uh, knocked off its post uh, very in the kind of revolution of coffee production in Vietnam from the late 90s on, onwards with the liberalization of, of the coffee market, uh, the focus on uh, ex, uh, producing mass quantities of coffee, uh, and since that time, it has always been number two, with Colombia pretty much always third, uh, sometimes being knocked off the post by Indonesia. Okay, what are we talking about in terms of employment? Uh, and when obviously, as you will see later on, we're not really focusing on formal employment, but more or less how many people are absorbed in the coffee industry in these respective countries. So in Brazil, there are roughly 300,000 coffee farmers, uh, officially 200,000 workers and unofficially uh, close to a million. Uh, Col in Colombia, uh, the industry is comprised of uh, approximately 575,000 coffee growing families uh, and it employs up to 800,000 workers. Uh, India, uh, there are more or less 360,000 coffee holdings and about a little over 630,000 coffee laborers and 600,000 farmers. And uh, Vietnam, more or less the same as Colombia, up to 800,000 uh, 
workers during the harvest season. So I think it's important when we're looking at kind of the economic upgrading uh, aspects of this study to talk about yields, yeah? uh, productivity, of course, in, in terms of the coffee or any agricultural uh, product. Uh, for the case of Brazil, it has a much higher coffee yield than in Colombia, even though, especially in the last 20 odd years, both countries have focused on the Arabica version of a variety of coffee, which is the highest quality coffee. Uh, Colombia has always been uh, an Arabica producing nation. Brazil has tried to move towards uh, the Arabica variety in the last 20 or so years. It has a much higher yield than Colombia, and that's precisely because the different top topographical conditions of the production. It's usually not like in Colombia, it's very high uh, mountainous terrain, but more or less in low tract uh, plains. So that allows it for the mechanization, which can focus on economies of scale, which is not the case for Colombia. Vietnam, uh, which is very much also on economies of scale, not so much through mechanization, but because it predominantly grows the Robusta variety of coffee, which doesn't entail hand picking, uh, even though it's done by laborers, not mechanized in the case of Brazil, but it's a different process of picking, which means it's a much higher productivity level for, for the production, but a lower level of um, price yields. And uh, for India, they have a lower level of, um, of yields than Vietnam, of course, uh, due also to its different focus on you know, the type of variety and also type of labor employed in this aspect. Uh, one other aspect, which is very important, I think that we looked about, uh, and this, this has to do with the differences in terms of how the coffee industry is regulated in the respective countries. And prior to the deregulation of the world coffee market, the international coffee agreements, which um, were completely ended in 1989. Prior to this, you had very strong state intervention in these markets in the four countries. In Brazil, from the early 19, uh, 20th century, 1933, the National Coffee Department was, was created and it was very uh, interventionist in terms of trying to increase the price paid for coffee for the for the Brazilian uh, coffee exports. However, in the 1990s, with the kind of ending of the ICAs, the Brazilian government went to a deregulatory uh, facet and completely, not completely, but uh, to a large extent, stepped outside of its regulation of the coffee industry within the country. Colombia is a very different case in that respect, followed uh, Brazilians lead, I guess, in terms of its interventionist stance, but much more so uh, because coffee is uh, very much focused all over the country in terms of production. So it has a very strong uh, growers uh, pressure point within the national government and through the National Coffee Growers Federation, which was created in 1927. But differently to Brazil, with the deregulation of the world coffee market in the early 1990s, Colombia government did not, or the National Coffee Growers Federation did not step outside its role. Rather, it tried to refocus its intent in terms of upholding a stable price for coffee growers in the country. In India, you see the evidence of the liberalization of coffee production, the Coffee Board of of India was previously a monopoly in terms of directing coffee policy, uh, but now it's under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry within the government of industry. So it's, it's lost since the 1990s, a lot of its uh, power to, to push forth different policies and different regulatory intents. And in Vietnam, I guess because of the political regime, which is very different as well, it very much went towards uh, an opening up a freedom of the of the market with the 1990s with the world, uh, the global deregulation part and gave more power to, 
to farmers, liberalize the quota system, et cetera. And since then you can see an explosion of Vietnamese production. Just to give uh, a little bit visually in terms of which kind of actors we're seeing that are involved in the whole coffee uh, supply chain, at least within Colombia. So we're looking at 33 uh, grower co cooperatives of different sizes across the country. You have also kind of this focus, one of the focuses of the economic upgrading intense through the creation of Juan Valdez Cafe, uh, which has over 400 stores worldwide uh, from 2018 at least. Uh, different government institutions involved in the coffee markets, the certification systems, which are pretty much found all over these four countries, but um, especially in Colombia and Brazil, Fair Trade, Rainforest Alliance, UT Certified, Nespresso, Starbucks, eh, Organic, etc. And there you have kind of the, auth the authorized North American retailers, exporters of Colombian coffee. We have 436 registered exporters in the country. And I think it's important to include the workers, but also the other actors involved in this industry, the fertilizers, uh, Acron, Biomonsanto, Bio et cetera. Okay, what are some of the preliminary conclusions in terms of market access and prices? Uh, we found that probably one of the distinguishing features in terms of possibilities for economic upgrading is the presence or lack of presence of cooperatives. Uh, the cooperatives generally were found to give more bargaining power uh, to the actual growers and take away, I guess, the, the power that many of the middlemen have over, over growers, especially, for example, in the case of India, where there are no formal contracts, uh, they offer loans previous to the growing phase, etc. So they have this structural power over the growers. Uh, also the case of Vietnam, where the middlemen provide the input, but in Colombia and Brazil, uh, they have particularly over the last 20 or 30 years accorded, I guess, much more strength to these cooperative uh, bodies, which protect in a way uh, the, the growers, the farmers, in Colombia, it's much more small scale. In Brazil, it's medium to large scale, but they offer them a little bit of protection within this globally uh, deregulated market. In the case of Brazil, very quickly, economic upgrading takes the form of process and product upgrading. You have, there's been a change, you know, from the use of manual work, which, including, which includes the weeding, herbicides, the picking and everything else. It's moved to mechanical processes, and that's why the yield is so much, so much larger than in the case of Colombia. So they've been able to focus on economies of scale in that sense to, um, to get more money from more production and to uh, reduce costs, uh, particularly in terms of labor costs. Colombia is a little bit different. It does have the same kind of types of economic upgrading, the product and the process upgrading, but in different levels. So from the deregulation of the 1990s, there was a refocus from the National Coffee Growers uh, Organization that tried to develop a multi-pronged strategy where they were not only looking at high quality Colombian coffee, but to make sure that the quality control was key to ensure that the global price could be a little bit higher uh, than the case for Brazilian coffee, Vietnamese coffee, and all the other coffee producing countries in the world, except for uh, a few Central American countries, which also have these um, uh, mild coffees. Uh, and I guess looking here in terms of farm workers, because generally when you're, the literature looks at economic upgrading processes and opportunities, and social upgrading generally focus on, focuses on uh, economies of scale, but then for the case of small, small holders, uh, mid-sized farmers, et cetera, but leaves the workers out of the equation. And we found interestingly, 
There was an outlier in terms of the case, in, in terms of labor conditions or employment conditions, and that was Brazil, where you did have uh, a degree of formality in the Brazilian case. Uh, now, while you have less workers per hectare, because it's very mechanized, uh, most of the workers that have a little bit more uh, skill level, I guess, to work with heavy machinery, et cetera, do receive uh, salaries and many of them are affiliated to trade unions. So you do have the existence of uh, trade unions in this industry, which is not the case in the other three countries. In Colombia, it's over 90% informality, uh, no, no coverage by uh, workplace accidents and insurance schemes, not, uh, not affiliated to any pension scheme either, generally paid by piecemeal. So that does seem to be the case that, whereas in Brazil, you've seen a reduction in number of workers through the mechanization process, the workers do receive better uh, wages to a degree and a little bit more stability. However, as it's a seasonal product, it happens with pretty much all the uh, perishable products, but also seasonally focused uh, agricultural products, it is very much a seasonal market. So workers are employed for the couple of months of the year when a uh, harvest is around and that really uh, takes away their possibility of getting any times of employment uh, stability. But I'll leave it, I'll leave it at that. Uh, I think it's better to leave for the discussion. Uh, my colleagues, for example, Bruno can go into more depth of the Brazilian case and we can answer any, any, any of the questions that uh, the people are here to to ask. So thanks very much. Great, thank you so much, Dan. And for highlighting also the key role of cooperatives and collective action, which is one of the key topics um, of this book. Now uh, we've heard the three case studies about rice, about coffee and about mangoes. And um, we're now trying to make sense and learn some lessons from the future. And um, our next speaker, probably most of you, needs no introduction for most of you, um, is Professor Christoph Scherer, who is an economist and political scientist. He is Professor for Globalization and Politics at the University of Kassel and Director of the International Center for Development and Decent Work. So thank you so much, Christoph, and over to you. Well, first of all, I want to thank our wonderful authors and field researchers to have made that book possible there. And uh, it's uh, quite a bit of work to go into the field and to really understand uh, what's going on and uh, what are the implications for the smallholders and uh, the farmers. And I will move. Oops, why don't I move? Uh, now, directly to some of uh, the factors uh, that we looked at. And um, <clears throat> one was that we had a chosen mango as a perishable produce and uh, were thinking of uh, what kind of effect might it have. And we found that uh, the chain becomes much more complex. Uh, there is uh, uh, higher levels of standards to uh, be uh, taken into account and uh, refrigeration is necessary and so on. And those are high hurdles for smallholders. And uh, therefore they are not so likely to be part of that kind of a chain. And uh, what we did find is that seasonal farm labor sometimes do profit because uh, of the perishability, because once uh, they are not harvested the mangoes, uh, then uh, they will lose uh, their value in the market uh, very quickly. There. But uh, there are many ways of trying nevertheless to uh, make sure that uh, labor is rather cheap and controlled uh, there. So there are then uh, political means in uh, securing then the farm labor at a rather low cost. Yeah. As Dan had already shown for the Brazilian case, which is uh, a key case concerning mechanization, uh, that it can lead to social upgrading, 
but for a smaller group, uh, usually uh, more skilled, and it leads to overall more seasonal uh, work employment and thus, in a way, a downgrading in there. Then rice uh, is, of course, of great nutritional importance. And here, as Manish had uh, pointed out, uh, we do see not necessarily immediately the government jumping in and helping out the uh, smallholders and to make sure that there is ample supply of rice. No, that really is then depending on the local political uh, scenery. And here in Indian Punjab, uh, there was more support uh, for the farmers. It would be interesting to find out to what extent uh, this was made possible by uh, farmers' mobilization uh, then. Uh, yeah. And uh, coffee is something that uh, is traditionally earned uh, foreign exchange for countries. And uh, as uh, governments are interested for very good reasons in foreign exchange, uh, they have become involved. But in the neoliberal times, they had been pushed out a bit, uh, but nevertheless uh, were uh, still around or were at least then encouraging uh, larger cooperatives. Uh, of course, around here in Vietnam, in uh, then uh, Colombia, as we heard, it was then really uh, more uh, being conducive, but uh, it was in the hands of uh, the growers themselves. And in Brazil, some of the growers are so big that it is very much in their hands uh, there. Then uh, a key issue was uh, the role of the end markets. And uh, does a foreign end market lead to more upgrading? in terms also of work conditions and so on, and the livelihood. And here, uh, the findings were not so surprising that uh, the foreign markets are more demanding and there are quite high hurdles for the smallholders to really make good of it. And uh, they, uh, if they are part of it, then they are usually uh, more in the position of weakness vis-a-vis -vis some bias, unless, and that is the main message overall in the book, unless they are well organized and uh, that uh, has been shown for the case in uh, Colombia. What is necessary, and that again Colombia showed, was to create one's own brand there and to access uh, the consumers uh, more directly. But uh, building up your own brand is a very uh, costly exercise and of course then also requires collective action. Certification comes with rather high costs for smallholders and uh, not always a guarantee for higher prices. They are just perhaps a guarantee to then uh, find the market. And here again, um, it needs uh, collective action. Uh, so uh, to keep the costs down, smallholders have to team up. And uh, the criteria of certifications uh, are more conducive to then uh, the hygiene uh, of the production process because that has an impact on the product quality, but less so on other aspects of uh, the working conditions. And uh, there is also quite a lack of enforcement concerning uh, the um, farm laborers. Uh, more is the livelihood of smallholders in the focus of some of the certification agencies, but not uh, the workers that are employed by the smallholders. <coughs> Coming to a bit of a theoretical argument that uh, we have made that uh, uh, successful economic upgrading does not necessarily lead to a trickle down in better working conditions. Uh, there is a disconnect between the product and the labor market, 
the labor market has its own rules and uh, um, the rules are concerning of course uh, uh, economic logic the logic of uh, supply and demand and of course uh, the whole system of power asymmetries uh, that are around the labor relation uh, there. The overall conclusion would be that uh, the buyers, the input providers, the owners usually command over more material uh, access resources and political resources. And I think that needs to be really stressed that the material also translates into political res resources. And this power is embedded in a really a wide net of institutions. And uh, concerning the juridical uh, status of uh, these corporations, that they can act like persons but are not responsible like persons, uh, the protection of intellectual property rights and uh, specific trade agreements that uh, favor then international corporations over local competitors. And the list goes on. And one can conclude that it is the neoliberal historic bloc that uh, allows then uh, these actors to exercise more power over the smallholders. The state is, uh, of course, then uh, very important uh, concerning the labor laws and the enforcement. And we have seen that uh, in most cases, the state is not very uh, engaged uh, in relationship to labor, especially agricultural labor. Uh, maybe a bit for the smallholders, but uh, agricultural labor is usually outside. And uh, one exception was uh, under the um, Labour Party in Brazil. And I'll come to that example at the very end. The capitalist state is an unequal terrain, and that's the reason uh, why the state usually is um, not very supportive for the agricultural workers, because they also lack uh, political power. And therefore, one really needs to mobilize various power resources, especially also power resources of solidarity with stronger social groups in society in pursuit of social upgrading. One very quick little uh, example, it is a cooperative in Brazil uh, that has managed to build its own brand. And you see it here on the left hand, Terra Livre. And uh, you also see that they have uh, then also the silos and uh, <clears throat> uh, for the rice, meaning that they control the value chain and thereby are able then to uh, profit from it more so than those who do not have this uh, solidarity power. And uh, here as they had uh, government support, uh, like the cooling houses that I have just shown, and that the government also helps with the procurement of the organic rice. Uh, that their uh, success, of course, because it is supported by uh, political power, rests on political power and a change in government of course, then undermines uh, that uh, possibility for them. So they uh, have to work harder now in the marketplace and uh, under great duress. And that leads then to the final summary. There is an importance of collective action uh, for economic upgrading itself, of course, then also for social upgrading. The weak groups, do need more support and uh, because they are not powerful enough for themselves, uh, stronger groups, and that means also people in academia, consumers and so on, uh, need to raise their awareness about the plight of uh, these, especially farm workers and uh, give them uh, political support. <laughs> On that note, I want to thank you to listen to me and I have to quickly switch now my Zoom because I have to vote 
in a dean in our department. I'll be back soon. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christoph, and good luck for the vote. And uh, indeed, what's very interesting are, is this framing of power. That's something that's often addressed and we often use as a word, but um, very few times there is an actual framing of power, which is also something you can find in the book. So um, now it's my honor to introduce Pravin Jha, who is Professor for Economics at the Center for Economic Studies and Planning and adjunct professor at the Center for Informal Sector and Labor Studies at the School of Social Science, JNU in India. His major areas of research and teaching is political economy of development, in particular labor, agriculture, and education. Thank you and over to you, Praveen. Thank you, Florian. I'm indeed uh, grateful to the hosts, the organizing committee for this book launch, for asking me to be part of this conversation, which is indeed uh, an extremely important theme, an extremely important issue. And this book indeed is a very, very important contribution to the debate, to the discussion, to the literature, which is emerging on what is variously described as value systems, value chains, supply chains, and so on and so forth. And lots of uh, debates about the nomenclature itself. I mean, is it good to call it chains or production networks or production systems or, you know, but we don't have time to get into that. You know, I've been dabble, dabbling in this area for uh, more than a decade and very early on, I rejected uh, most of these. In fact, I shifted from the chain metaphors to the production network metaphor, but even that I found too inadequate. And hence, what I use is value systems because a large number of actors who participate or benefit or control or sort of uh, are critical in sort of, uh, you know, these uh, systems that we are talking about, they actually do not even soil their hands or feet with production. They're not direct participants and so on. Finance capital, for instance which is a very, very big player in controlling, directing, etc. But let me not get into these issues uh, because that would be a large discussion in its own right. Uh, fundamentally, what I wish to do is to locate what we heard just now in a broader framework of situating some of these debates. Now, essentially what we have, if you put it at a very high level of generality, Essentially, we have two very distinct paradigms. One, what I call management paradigms or managerialist paradigms, which are driven by and large by mainstream economics. Right? And sort of uh, there is a kind of innocent optimism about the prospects of supply chains, value chains, etc. cetera. Uh, if not triumphalism, that look, this is, what is the best for everybody in the world? You know, someone like Jeremy, for instance, tells you that it's not only uh, sort of necessary, but uh, it's a sine qua non. If countries want to progress, if their workers want to get a better deal and so on and so forth, there's just no other way, right? So there's one kind of extreme. And then uh, that, 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 as I said, is a triumphalist kind of uh, announcement. Uh, and there's a very large literature. In fact, the dominant literature on the theme is broadly driven by this kind of discourse. In contrast, you have the alternative framework, which is um, political economy framework, where again, you have lots of very different approaches, voices and so on. And this book locates itself very firmly in the uh, political economy uh, framework as such. But as I said, I mean, you have political economy and political economy, right? Uh, so, you know, sort of how do we, make sense of this book. And I'll come to that in a minute, but before that, you know, the significance of uh, something like a uh, political economy approach uh, is captured very well in a somewhat semi-serious uh, kind of, uh, 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 if not a very grand remark by someone like Emmanuel Walterstein, who once talking in Delhi, posed a question, does India exist? He was giving a talk in Delhi, 
And his question was, does India exist? Now, what is it that he's talking about? Basically, he's trying to force us to think about the world system as a whole and the very powerful forces and actors and processes which are part of that, right? And how does that influence making and shaping of India, of the economic processes in India and so on? So I will not get into a fuller discussion of, as I said, uh, uh, these different approaches and so on, but it is important to sort of organize the literature that we have uh, globally on this theme in these two broad approaches. And you have very distinct shades of arguments, et cetera, et cetera even within these distinct approaches. So it's not the case that you know, there's some homogenization that we can claim for either of these approaches, but it's very important to sort of uh, make a distinction. Important point here is that the political economy approaches ask us to engage with the nitty gritty, with the power relations, with collective actions, the power resources, asymmetries, et cetera, that Christoph was talking about was the end. That, you know, how do we connect all this to make any sense? Whereas you have a very simple-minded economic reasoning based on supply and demand, you know, which informs the first kind of uh, broad approaches and talking about that if you do this, then you might sort of benefit uh, a great deal and so on and so forth. Now, I'll stop on that particular point, which was my first point, which is talking of the last distinct approaches and so on. Importance of this book yeah, is that it focuses on agriculture. Agriculture is um, a sector which, as uh, most of you know, uh, accounts for an estimated 2.5 billion people worldwide who are involved directly in smallholder agriculture, right? Just smallholder agriculture, right? Now, as it happens, you know, close to 70% of world's farmland are integrated into corporate food system. And, you know, this whole value chain, supply chains, uh, you know, uh, value system, etc. And 80% of these are smallholder agricultures. Now, this is the importance of this sector. And, you know, so in terms of its numerical weight in uh, uh, the well-being of the world's population, etc., it's a very, very important sector in understanding what's going on there, right? So in that sense, you know, what ICC, I, ICDD has done over the years, for which it should be applauded and hugely complimented, is to focus on agriculture like no other institution that I know of, right? In terms of looking at agriculture in global value systems over almost a decade or so, and this is, as uh, Smail mentioned, the third book in the series. So in that sense, uh, through a series of partnerships across the globe and so on, it sort of uh, has done a human service, a very important service. So that is the significance of the book, which we must appreciate and I must, uh, pay compliments to ICDD for this, uh, to Christoph, to uh, Smile and everybody else who is associated with it, uh, including this illustrious list of uh, partners across the world and so on. As regards the key focus within this broad theme, you know, it sets something very simple for itself. On page two and page six of the book, you know, the introductory chapter, it puts the objectives very clearly, which again is extremely important because it's a large theme, you can get lost, right? So it says that, okay, we would be looking at this particular thing, and that is economic and social upgrading, in particular social upgrading. Social upgrading itself is defined in a very sort of uh, uh, clear manner, whether you like it or not, but yes, there is a very, very clear kind of focus on what it means. ILO's notion of decent work connects with that, etc. It talks of lots of problems connected with the conceptual dimensions of economic upgrading, social upgrading, measurement issues, and so on, most of these problems are indeed unresolved. Conceptually and empirically, there is a large literature on these things, and we know that there are lots of difficulties, yet with a caveat and with very important caveats, yeah, uh, it is stated that, okay, let's take a stock, let's take a call. Again, I will not get into the details of uh, the challenges relating to the framing of economic upgrading and social upgrading. Let me leave it at that. In terms of 
the case studies, you know, very, very satisfying sort of treatment of the different crops, different regions, different themes, right? Uh, exactly what are the factors in those specific contexts, crops and countries, areas, yeah? Uh, and there is a substantial part which has been covered there in terms of the nitty gritty, the role of, let's say the macroeconomic policies, uh, the role of various other factors, which influence how things shape, et cetera, over time in terms of prospects of some improvement or lack of improvement, et cetera. So as uh, uh, Smile in his uh, opening remarks uh, made it very clear uh, sort of how economic upgrading does not necessarily uh, translate into social upgrading, uh, what are the needs and challenges there, et cetera. Uh, Walter highlighted a couple of key factors there in terms of understanding the current juncture, right? We can add a lot more to that, but he raised some very, very important points. Manish, Thales, Dan, all of them gave us very, very important nuggets of wisdom in terms of at least making sense of in a provisional sort of manner, in a contextual manner, how things are operating in some parts of the world. And from there, Christoph takes us to the, you know, putting together all these uh, case studies uh, in a conceptual framework to tie up some of the findings, some of the important lessons, messages which are emerging from these case studies. So in that sense, you know, there is a very good connect between trying to sort of frame the conceptual within the book with respect to what is emerging from the case studies. So the conceptual is not really getting into an open-ended sort of uh, discourse, but really drawing very strongly on the case studies. Right? So that again is the strength of the book. Uh, in terms of, uh, so as Christoph mentions uh, in, his, in his presentation, but all this is, of course, you know, what we heard was more like uh, a trailer of a film. You really have to read the chapters very, very carefully to get the main substance out of it. Yeah, it, it was just sort of uh, some teasers which you got, some teasers that you, uh, you know, that, that, that was served to all of us, but there is much more there in terms of uh, the richness and the nitty gritty, as I said, and Christoph then puts all this together in a very uh, useful kind of framework. He calls it neoliberal historic block, uh, and then focuses in particular on issues of asymmetries of power, collective action, etc. Right uh, now, what he does is also a strength of the book, but also, you know, in a sense. Uh, a limitation because he does not then go beyond it to explore some of the very important issues which are, which are part of the contemporary discourses. For instance, you know, how does all this connect with, let's say, global imperialism? You know, what is the role of agribusinesses in driving that imperialism? Right? The fact of the matter is that Christoph chooses something which is conditioned very importantly by his own case studies, right? The case studies which are there. And then either we sort of take the whole project in terms of its organic connectedness, right? And find something there, dwell on some of the things which are highlighted in important ways and stop there or we go beyond that, right? Or we do both, right? Now, if, you know, you ask me what ought to be done, having written this book for all the authors and the editors, it would be questions of this kind. Yeah, if you are talking of a global agricultural value system, what are the next steps that we can extract, that we can sort of uh, uh, build on, 
uh, in terms of what has already been achieved in very important ways. So that 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 would be uh, sort of uh, you know my uh, takeaway, uh, my, uh, my suggestion uh, to all our important authors. Uh, in fact, the title of the book, uh, in a sense, says it all as regards what it has achieved. That is the phantom of upgrading in agricultural supply chains, right? So it essentially tells us that there is very little which is being achieved in terms of upgrading, especially for the workers. Large farmers, they get a little bit. Some cooperatives under some institutional arrangements, some farmers do manage to get some things, as Dan mentioned for Colombia and in some other places, etc. Punjab farmers get a little more than the Bihar farmers in case of uh, Manish's uh, study and so on. Likewise, Thales's case study from Brazil tells us something, which is again a differentiated uh, story, etc. So, you know, I think it's important to look at some of these important sort of takeaways, lessons, which are clearly emerging from here. But on balance, what is it that we are getting? the phantom of upgrading in agricultural supply chains, which is the main conclusion in some sense, right? And that's a very, very appropriate conclusion. And the title itself is very appropriate in terms of getting the essence of it. But yes. in terms of unraveling it, I think mm -hmm. it's very important to take the next step. Let me leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florian and everybody else. Thank you so much, Professor Ja. And indeed, I'm sure that's not the end of the conversation, but uh, the beginning of many future conversations, also between you and Christoph. But I'm afraid uh, time won't allow right now to go further into those. So let's briefly come to the q and I only see one question, which I would pose to uh, manage, which is on India. Considering the scenario of the Indian economy, where half of the population is engaged in agriculture, what are the steps that India should take to improve their value chains? As we have seen in India, farmers are not well connected to supply chains. As a result, their welfare always remains in question. Do you want to take a step at that, Manish? Uh, do we have time to intervene or? Uh, in, okay, let me just uh, say something briefly. So uh, as I have already highlighted in the presentation that uh, intervention of a state is very much important uh, especially for the small holders participation in the value system as a whole. But the important question that we should ask, what kind of uh, 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 connection, what kind of involvement of the small holders we want uh, in the overall value system? Uh, let me give you one example from Himachal Pradesh last, year, last month only. Uh, there was a contract farming arrangement between a very famous company in India uh, who happens to be the owner of that company, happens to be friend of our prime minister. Uh, Mr. Adani. So uh, after one crop for Apple, he decided on their own, the company decided to decrease the price, the procurement price. And was it legal? Yes, it was legal because uh, they decided uh, to decrease the price on the basis of some changes in specification of the product. So the size of Apple, color of Apple, etc. On that basis, they decided to change the price, decrease the price. But uh, so this kind of involvements are also there. So in such existing situation, what is the role of a state uh, in order to support smallholders farmers, which, uh, which is almost 85% of the total farming community. So the role of government is very much important. And one important role that I see is through uh, uh, secured price for uh, produce which uh, on the same idea, the farmers are protesting in India right now. So that can be one critical intervention where, because we know uh, through some empirical evidence that the minimum support price announced by the government of India is actually operating as maximum price, uh, which is farmers generally tries to get. So they wish to get. Uh, so that is what one portion from where the government can intervene through uh, guaranteeing the uh, uh, MSP price for the farm produce. And uh, once that is there, then obviously, because farmers are almost 52% of the Indian population. So through increasing their income, is increasing the income of smallholder farmers, the government can also intervene in the demand side of the economy. And through there, uh, they can successfully uh, 
uh, uh, move forward in terms of the overall economy performance. Great, thank you so much, Manish. And we really want to be uh, mindful of everybody's time, but we have one last quiz for you, for all of our participants, um, where the first question is, um, in your opinion, do the benefits of joining agri global agricultural supply chains outweigh the risks? And uh, you should be able to see on your screen now the poll and uh, feel free to make your vote. And the second question is, what's the most important condition for economic and social upgrading of smallholders? So I hope you can see the polls on your screen and please um, start voting. Okay, and we see the first, the first replies go, coming in. And you will be able to, res to see the results in a second. Six people, eight people. So this is really another section where we want to hear from you, from all of you as participants, who have kindly made time to stay even until now with us. Okay, let me end the poll now and let's look at the results. So as you can see, it depends. Most of you think that it depends um, if the risks outweigh the, um, the benefits. And the single most important precondition is collective action and then active role of the state and changing power relations. And indeed, I think that's very, very much in line with the main messages of the book. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you to all the speakers and authors um, for writing this fantastic book, joining us today to present the results. Thanks you to all of you as participants for staying and listening to all these insights. Um, yeah, you can stay tuned uh, on our social media channels about future events. And uh, let me say a warm um, thank you to all of you again and stay healthy and connected in this continuously difficult times. Thank you and all the best. <laughs>